Checkout Tracking by the NPD Group brings you a receipt collecting system that gathers data anonymously through technology we created, providing your businesses with answers. Our next speaker is an industry-renowned monetization expert. You've probably read his articles and essays about monetization design in many industry publications. And the bad news is that if he's writing about your game, you've probably messed up big time. He's now with Network in their product and, and uh, monetization program. Please give a big round of applause in welcoming to the stage, Mr. Ethan Levy. Good morning, everyone. Uh, as Scott said, my name is Ethan Levy. I'm here today to present a talk I'm calling The Tower of Want. Um, so first, a little bit about me. Uh, I have been designing and producing games for 13 years now. Uh, worked on over 50 ship titles, mostly free to play, mostly mobile at this point. Here are some of them. Uh, before I joined Network in April, for the past three years, I was a monetization design consultant. So fun fact, I consulted on Family Guy, which our last speaker talked about. And I also consulted for our next speaker at his previous company on the free-to-play Mobitome. Um, so I've worked on a lot of stuff. Uh, these are some of the ones I can talk about. Some of the ones that I can't talk about include two of last year's top 10 selling console games. Um, and yeah, I work at Network now. Uh, we don't really have job titles, so I just do monetization and game design work. Network has not released its first game yet, uh, but it is the new company by the former NG Moco co-founders, and I promised my game team I would not molly new them today, so I can't really tell you anything about my game. Um, but I will... Uh, I want to tell you about my motivation for giving this talk so you can understand uh, kind of why I think it's important and what it's trying to accomplish. Um, so as our last speaker talked about, and as I'm sure has been a theme at this conference, uh, if you have a free-to-play game, running live events is one of the most important ways to engage your audience, uh, your elder players, and to make money. This is one of my favorite infographics. It's from maybe three years ago. Uh, from Modern War by Gree, where you can see on the bottom they tout $2.3 million in one weekend as the event hall, uh, and that their average daily revenue when running an event was 600% higher uh, than it was during non-event times. And this is like a three-year-old's, uh, two-year-old slide. Okay, so it's, it's uh, it, we can assume that the revenue impact of events has only increased since then. Um, so as a consultant, I had a couple mantras that I would go to time and time again uh, that I would talk about in lectures like this one. One of those was uh, visualize your core loop as simply as possible in your economic sinks and taps so you can get a hold of what is happening in your economy uh, in your design before you find the terrible uh, exploits in it when it goes live. Uh, the second thing I would say over and over again was to make purchasing present in your core loop. Uh, and so to make sure that at every, phrase, at every phase of the game, not only is the player having fun, but it's clear um, that they can spend money, how to spend money, and they get a lot of value out of doing so. And what happened was sometimes that was great advice that worked out really well that helped move a uh, developer in the right direction. Um, sometimes uh, people would come back to me with their core loop and it looks very nice. This looks just like a core loop design I would draw up on the board to help talk about a game system or game economy I was building. Uh, but then I would say, okay, now walk me through how the player moves through the stages of these various design pillars of your game and how the economy works. And they would, and although they had drew, uh, drawn everything as a nice circle, uh, where the economy, where the player moves from point to point, spending currency and earning currency, um, I would talk them, or I would try and get them to talk through it, and it was clear that they had no idea uh, how their economy worked or how things were supposed to link together. Um, 
The other thing that would happen a lot that was equally frightening was I'd say, do you have a monetization strategy? Can you sp send it to me? And I'd get something like this that you just look at and you're like, I, I don't know. I don't know where to start there. You have, the, you, this, is, this is not a design that's easy to parse and understand for us, the designers, so how's it gonna be easy to parse for your players and for us to figure out where the spend happens? Um, so again, it was kind of an underpants gnome situation with that sort of design. And, and those two things happened to me a lot when, when working with developers. Um, so what I've been looking for is kind of like a simple, concrete method to help a designer frame their elder retention and monetization challenges so that uh, when they're designing the event system from the start, they can make sure that it'll achieve the two key goals. One being to keep your veteran players engaged over the long term and make sure they're having fun, and then to also encourage your spenders to spend more money and to encourage your non-spenders to spend uh, because of some sort of limited, time-limited event uh, that does all the wonderful things Rich just talked about in the previous lecture. Um, and so I've come across something that I am calling the Tower of Want. Uh, so very important caveat, uh, for an event system work to work to retain players and to monetize, your game has to be fun. The fundamentals of your game have to be fun and have to monetize well. Um, metrics talk, that means you have to have good retention and you have to have good conversion. If you don't have those two things, the best design tower of want in the world is not going to turn your game around, right? You, you have to fundamentally have something great. So let's just assume you've done that. You've, you've built a game that uh, will retain your players and that will monetize at a very good base level. A Tower of Want is an escalating series of short and long-term goals, each of which feeds into the next goal. Okay, it's a dense sentence, so let me give you an example. I want to do my homework at night so that I can get good grades, so that I can get into a top college, so that I can work for a top company, so that I can get into Y Combinator, so that I can raise VC funds from the right firm, so that I can be a successful startup CEO, so that I can have a big exit, so that I can finally afford to buy a house in San Francisco where the median home price is $1.4 million. That is one of life's most hilarious towers of want. And what's important to realize is that uh, when I'm at stage one, when I'm doing my homework in middle school, I don't have to know that I need $1.4 million and that's why I'm doing this activity. This core activity has to be self-contained and rewarding in and of itself. But what's important is that as I escalate up that tower of want, I always discover something new to want and some new, something new to do to get what I desire, right? So, um, how I came up with this example was, this is a slide from one of my latest design documents, but replaced with the Tower of Want from real life, right? In a game, it's usually two core system, you know, multiple core systems that'll support each level, right? So if you look at the very first pyramid, or down on the bottom, uh, my want is to get into a prestigious school, right? So I have to do my homework loop and my extracurricular loop. And then I ascend to the next tower where I'm in the prestigious school, I'm still doing homework and I'm still doing ec extracurriculars and I'm doing all that while also finding unique skills so that I can get into the corporation loop. Once I get into the corporation loop, I have to do everything I've already done and also do a bunch of R&D on the side so that I can ascend to the fundraising loop and on and on and on until uh, you sell your company for $400 million and you can finally afford a one bedroom apartment with no green space in the back in one of the coldest, foggiest cities in the city, in the country. Um, so yeah, I talked about this. You don't have to know your end goal as you step up the pyramid, it's just important that you discover something new to want. And that something new to want is what is going to cause you as a player to retain. Um, and it's also important that each new goal you want, you know, each new goal you set for yourself uh, is built on your previous knowledge and your previous skills. Um, so let me talk about one of my favorite games of recent uh, success, which is Heroes Charge. Um, 
he was charged as so much right and so much wrong, and it's like an incredibly frustrating game, right? It's very successful. It's been consistently in the top 100 for however many months. Um, it's my feeling that it should be in the top 25, uh, and it should have been for a long time, and it should continue to be for a long time. Uh, and the reason, the reasons that I feel uh, that Hero's Charge is not performing as well as Sumner's War is, which it should, it should be doing as well as Sumner's War is, if not beating it, it uh, you can discover those problems by thinking about Hero's Charge's design in this Tower of Want framework. So let's take a simple tower uh, element from Hero's Charge. I want to farm PvP, PvE so that I can increase the power of my team so that I can increase my rank and performance in PvP. That's a pretty familiar pattern that uh, a lot of core games that'll have a PvP event system will use. So uh, it's here, again, it's, it's much more of a, a pyramid than a ladder necessarily, but at the top you see my PvP ladder loop, right? Um, in order to increase my team power to, cl to climb higher on that PvP ladder, I have to do two things. I have to power up my team, and I have to enchant my gear. Powering up my team requires me to do the normal PvE farming, and then there's also a special part of the game called Trials that I uh, have to do to get some of the higher level um, catalysts that evolve my heroes. So doing those two together helps me power up my team. On the right side, each person on my team has a bunch of gear, and I can, every time I equip a piece of gear to a hero, I can also sacrifice other gear as well as coins into that gear to make it more powerful to raise that hero's stats so that I can beat other players in PvP. Uh, right? Really good. And so that you get the gear from PvE rating, and you get the coins primarily from crusading, which is another kind of mid-game feature that they introduce. So like a really good Tower of Want. Everything feels like it's holding together well. And what's nice, like Crusade is one of my favorite things to do in Heroes Charge, or was while I was an active player. Um, I washed out after about 60 days, which I'll tell you about in a minute. But even within Crusade, there's a nice Tower of Want, right? When you unlock it, you discover that this becomes the best place in the game to farm for coins, and it's really well timed with the part of your discovery as a player when coins becomes a really big pinch. So you're like, oh, I'm getting pinched really hard on coins if I want to ascend this PvP ladder, and great, here's this cool new feature that allows me to get a lot of coins, in fact, more than anything else I'm doing in the game. So. Within that crusade, there are multiple levels of wanting. Um, at first, uh, you just want to get as far into this 15 uh, battle crusade as possible to get a bunch of coins. And when you first unlock it, you generally do not have a team powerful enough to get all the way through. But eventually, you get a team powerful enough that beating the 15 waves of the crusade uh, each day, you can play this mode once each day, becomes pretty easy and routine and normal, but you need even more coins. So then you get over to the hard mode on Crusade, where instead of, uh, what is it, you can... Oh, your characters don't heal in between battles. So normal mode, you heal between battles. Then you ascend to hard mode, which is challenging and fun and requires you to have a better team uh, and also pays out more. And so then your new thing that you want is to have a team powerful enough to get all the way through Crusade every day um, to max it out to get the most coins. So that's a Tower of Want within a Tower of Want. It's really nice. Um, so here I am talking about all the things that Heroes Charge does with this Tower of Want that are really great. Now let me talk about the two questions that when you design your Tower of Want, you have to ask yourself to try and plug the holes, right? The two key reasons you're designing these Elder Game event systems are to retain your players and to make more money. So the first question is about uh, retention. At each stage of the pyramid, uh, as they ascend, you have to ask yourself, why will the player repeat this level of the tower every day for the next 
30 days, 60 days, 90 days. Why are they going to keep doing this activity over and over and over again? Um, because whether it's the events I'm talking about in Heroes Charge or the events Rich was talking about in Family Guy, it's still like uh, the molecule of game activity. You're doing the same thing over and over every day, and it's just a series of rewards that are, are uh, driving you, of desires and rewards that drive you to keep doing it. So why will the player repeat each level of the tower every day for X days? Um, if I look, if I go back to my tower from Heroes Charge, um, you know, Crusade gives me a really good reason to do it, right? Crusade, as I talked about, gives me a really great tower and a really great reason to do it every day that I'm active. Um, but the top of the tower that I was building towards is this PvP system. A uh, PvP system in Heroes Charge has kind of an ELO-like rank where you go up and down throughout the day, every day, as you defeat other people and as other people defeat you. You can play PvP for free five times a day, and then you can spend your hard currency to keep playing if you want to keep going up the rank. And the thing is, this system pays out once per day. And it pays out kind of a nominal reward. So if you're not someone who has the motivation to be on top of the PvP tower because being number one is important to you, if the direct incentives are also important to you, this daily reward has to be enough that you care about your rank each day. And what I discovered as an elder player here on day 45, 50, 60, once I had achieved all my power team goals and I had my team of all the heroes I'd been grinding for, leveled up to rarity level four, with great gear, fully enchanted, so like I feel like I'm finally competitive in PvP, is that all that effort was kind of uh, useless because all the energy that I would invest into climbing that tower of now the PvP ladder, the reward change is so small that I don't care. I don't care if I'm ranked 3,500 or ranked 1,200 at the end of each day because one, the reward period is short and the payout is short and I go up and down and I don't have a reason to invest in my long-term PvP performance. Um, and so this is one of the primary reasons I washed out of, of the system was that when I got to the thing I had been wanting, when I got to my long-term goal, I was like, uh, uh, there's nothing, there's no there there, essentially. The second question you have to ask is what repeatable purchase will help speed up progress at each level of the tower, right? And the key here is repeatable purchase. Um, this is something I found that I could never talk about enough as a uh, free-to-play free consultant, right? You have your MOBAs, uh, you, you have your League of Legends that are built on an uh, incredible base of devoted players throughout the world, tournaments and um, uh, permanent purchases, and uh, that is the exception. The majority of top grossing free-to-play games, and especially if we're talking about here at Casual Connect where we're probably mostly working on mobile games, the majority of these are built on repeatable purchases, not one-time purchases. So again, to go back to my Heroes Charge example, um, the repeatable per he uh, heroes are the permanent good that you want. They're the most valuable thing in the game. Um, and you buy them through a repeatable purchase of this uh, treasure chest mechanic. And here on the right, you can see the premium chest, about 300 hard currency for one chest, or uh, about 2,600 currency for 10 chests. And as you can see, this is like my end washout state. I have uh, 800 coins, which I, or hard currency, which is like I ended the game with $12 that I had spent and literally nothing I cared to spend it on. Um, and uh, just to give you some reference, that this 2,600 hard currency purchase is uh, about $25 in the game. So 10 chests costs about $25. Sometimes for $25 you get a new hero. Cloudwalker was the hero I wanted the most that uh, I uh, farmed and raided and played the daily events for like 45 days to grind up to where I unlocked Cloudwalker because in the $50 I spent mostly on chests, I never got him because it's a random gotcha pack, 
uh, not unlike Puzzle and Dragons or Monster Strike. But the problem is, once you get one of these characters, they're a permanent good, and their system for handling duplicates uh, was an extremely negative player experience, right? So this is like a layout of uh, 25 thing, uh, $25 that I spent. Nine of these 10 items are completely valueless to me, right? Only one of them, down in the bottom right, you see Arcane Sapper and a little seven in the bottom right corner. I already owned Arcane Sapper. He wasn't even a very useful hero to me. But because I already owned him, it transformed him into these seven stones. And relative spending to spending $25, I needed 100 stones to level him up to the next power level. And this was negative value. Like, this was so angering. I'm like, I spent $25 and you give me nothing. And so between these two systems, I have nothing to want and nothing to buy, and I washed out of a game that I played six times a day minimum every day for 60 days. And I do not play many free-to-play games that devoutly, right? I washed out after 60 days and $50 worth of spend. They should have had me for 120 days and over $250. But... Although their Tower of Want seems really good on paper, it falls apart when you ask yourself those two key questions, right? Why am I, I going to engage in each new level of the period daily for many days? And what repeatable purchase will help me speed up to the next tier of the pyramid at each level? Um, so what would I do about this if I was working on Heroes Charge? Well, I would start uh, by adding a time-limited event to the period, uh, or a time-limited event layer uh, with repeatable purchases. And then I'd add a GVG event layer with repeatable purchases. They have guilds in the game. They're totally underutilized. And if you design these two systems right, a PVP event system and a GVG event system, uh, it really should take this game from where it is, a stable 75 to 50, up to a stable you know, 30 to 10, fluctuating based on the days. Um, and yeah, so that is how I, apply, how I would apply the Tower of Want to Elder Feature Design to boost retention and monetization. And thank you for listening. So I've got a couple minutes for questions. Uh, we've got some job openings at Network. It's a really cool experience studio filled with awesome people uh, that doesn't make me miss the freedom of consulting at all. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter. You can email me if you have any questions or want to talk, Ethan at FamousAspect.com. So thank you. Thanks, Ethan. Um, Rob Ciccolini uh, at Turbine. Um, do you run into a problem where you have a rich PvE Tower of Want and the players get to a point where now you're trying to switch them to PvP, but they may not necessarily want to do PvP, and now they have nothing at the top end to do? Like, do you, do you know any... If you lose players due to the sort of, uh, I don't want to call it bait and switch because that's mm -hmm. a little negative, but where they're happy pursuing goals in a non-competitive environment and then at the top end there's no reason to keep doing that? Right. So if I could, uh, so the question is, um, is there a danger? Um, a lot of times I talk about event design, I'm talking in the context of core games, and the question is, is there a danger of if PVE is the core of your event and you put all your long-term hopes on PvP of losing those players. Um, and I think what you're hinting at is that your audience will be made up of a number of different player types and different types of metagame activities will appeal to different players in your audience. Um, the reason I end up talking about PvP a lot is because among top-grossing, core-facing games, it's like the thing that drives revenue and retention. Um, especially when you get the social dynamic of guild versus guild. So like, if there's a team of 25 people, there may only need to be one or two Saudi oil princes to make that team collectively spend $20,000 a week uh, or more. Uh, for some games, that's a low number. Um, but it, it, it does, A, it depends on your game and your audience. So you have to be monitoring that, um, what, where your players are spending their daily minutes, which buckets they're in. And if PvP isn't work, if you build a PvP system and it's not working, figure out how to sunset it and figure out how to build a time-limited PvE event system, for instance. 
Um, so yeah, it's there. It, it's it's certainly not a one size fits all solution, and it depends a lot on what your game is and what players show up to play it. Anybody else? All right. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Excellent talk, Ethan. You can stay at my house anytime.